So th today, uh, what I'm going to do this, the, the, the talk, uh, what I want to talk about today was wood-fired kilns, but this is actually part of a three-part series I'm going to do on kilns, and I'm sort of doing, planning on doing them in historical order. So we'll start off with wood-fired kilns, and then next month it'll be gas kilns, and then next month after that it'll be electric kilns, and possibly after that we might do a raku. I haven't decided on that yet, but at least it's going to be wood-fired and gas-fired and then electric. In terms and, and the same kind of format, talking about what, what does the kiln consist of, how do you operate them, what are typical problems, and this sort of thing, different designs of the kilns, and a little bit of the history of the kilns. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I, 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 I build this as, I'm calling an introduction to pottery kilns, because basically I wanted to attract people that, of, with different levels of interest or experience with, with kilns and wood kilns in particular, I didn't want to make it seem like it was only for people that already had a lot of experience. But if you've had experience and you have you know, you know, deep, very detailed and specific questions, that's fine too. The, the discussion doesn't have to be limited just to introduct, sort of more introductory. This is meant as an overview, really. There's only so much you can do in seven hours. No, it won't be that long. <laughs> but, 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 uh, so, okay, so first, I guess to start, one of the questions is, since we're starting way back with the beginning of kilns, is basically, what is a kiln? And you can define a kiln as an enclosed space in which you can fire pots in a controlled way. An enclosed space for firing pots. And th the key there is control. Even though when, we, when you talk about um, the history of, of kiln designs and the history of pottery, the, 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 the main theme that you will talk about as, as kiln designs evolved was gaining more control over the firing. And even though historically, they didn't, people didn't even know the science behind or the technology behind the kiln structure. By a lot of trial and error, they were basically still improving the control. And we'll talk about that a little bit as, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of kiln design. So really, the, the, we need kilns for, really, there are two main reasons why we need a kiln or a, a structure that you'd call a kiln. And the main one is control, so that we can actually have good control for the firing and be reproducible. If you think about the history of firing, where basically the work was made for primarily for functional work for production, reproducibility was really, really important. So if, if your livelihood depended on it, it was to be able to continue to make serviceable, workable, saleable items. So control was, it was primary importance in, in terms of making things. And the second reason why we need a, we need a kiln structure is to, is to reach high temperatures. Without a kiln structure, and without some of these designs, you simply can't get above, much above low bisque temperatures. So you need the structures to attain some of these higher temperatures, and you need the higher temperatures to accommodate different kinds of clays that are found around the world. Certain clays, for instance, in, in, in China, in different parts of China and Asia, simply can't be fired usably to low fire temperatures. They won't mature enough. So you need to develop the, these higher firing temperatures, and you need the kilns to do it. Up until, and, one thing that, and one thing to remember also, we've kind of gotten spoiled in, nowadays, is that up until the 20th century, all pottery was fired by burning something. It might have been wood, it might have been grass, it might have been dung, but something burn burning, bur burnable, whatever it was, depending on where you were in the world, that's the only way you could fire pottery. So the introduction of coal and gas and, and now electric is, is really a, a, an, an amazingly recent in, innovation compared to the long history of firing pottery. So I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of fuel burning kiln designs. And I'm saying fuel burning, not just wood burning in this case, because it could be anything. It could be when they started out, they weren't, they weren't necessarily fuel. A lot of it was they were firing with grass, or they were firing with twigs, or they were firing with, with dung. Um, so the first, the first and, the, and these, these, are, these different designs, have, they found archaeological records of them. So they have good, exam, good documented records of, these different, of examples of these different kind of firings. And the, first, the earliest firings um, were basically just an open bonfire, either on a, on, a, on a flat surface on the ground or in a very shallow pit. The, there'd be a layer of fuel that was put down, whatever it was, and pots were laid on that, and then more fuel was put on that. And so there was a pile of just alternating layers of pots and fuel and pots and fuel. Um, and then it was lit. And in some cases, um, the pile might have been, in, instead of just the, the final layer of fuel on top of the pots, 
there might have been a, 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 the pile might have been covered with ashes from the previous fire because they realized that people early on realized that you needed to do something to contain the heat. So they, they, people might have piled ashes from the previous fire on top of the fuel to sort of cover it or dirt or even broken pots. So essentially they were, they were con again, a, a, an early form of control to keep some of the heat, so the heat loss wasn't so, so much and you'd keep the heat in. But that was the earliest type. And these, a, a structure or a fire like that is really only capable of low earthenware temperatures. We're talking like cone 019 to 016. That's about the best you can do with it, which is in temperatures is like 1200 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Re really, so you'd make really low, you know, low fired, very porous, fairly weak pottery, still serviceable, but, but very, very low temperature. Um, historical examples, I don't know whether you're familiar with Japanese Joman pottery, very early, this is like 8000 BCE. There are some beautiful examples of classic Japanese pottery, and this was fired in this method. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not very, a lot of it was, was, um, was um, statuary or was, was work for temple work, temple was, you know, symbolic work, it wasn't so much functional, but very beautiful. And, and all Native American pottery was fired this way. And this, the thing is about, what's interesting about all these techniques or these different stages in the evolution, they're still used somewhere in the world. We've evolved, in, in the Western, Western world we've evolved and, in, and in, in industrial settings we've evolved past them, but almost all of these techniques you can still find people firing um, this way, either because of tradition or because of necessity. Um, the first really primitive kilns, they, from the evidence that I found, they date back to about 8,000 or 7,000 BCE. And they found really good examples in Iraq of these things. And all they were, all it consisted of was a circular wall or a circular enclosure of stones, basically. It would be a ring of stones that might be a foot or two high, and there'd be holes in the base of the wall at different places around the base for the fire. So that they just, they'd build this circular sort of pit, only it'd be above ground, just of stones, pile the pots in there, and then build fire, and then have holes in the, in the wall at the base with fires around the outside. So the fire, the fire would come in through the holes, go up through the pots, and just rise out through the top. So the, the, the wall did, did, so they were basically what was considered top, if you want to talk about terminology, it was a top-loaded structure. You'd just have the circular ring of stones and you'd pile the pots in there. Um, and occasionally, in some cases, again, the pile, once the pots were piled into this, this corral of stones, the, pot, the pile would be covered with dirt or shards of broken pots. And they, as I said, they found some really good examples of these structures in Iraq and other places in the Middle East. The first true kilns, if you want to call it a true kiln, um, there's some good examples from Mesopotamia around 4000 BCE. And what, what, what they're defining, historians and archaeologists are defining it as a true kiln because at this point, there was a separate chamber for the fire and the ware. So that the, the, they, the fire, unlike the bonfire, even the previous one, where they were in, in, in direct contact, in this case, you could still have this, this ring of stones, but you'd have some kind of a floor, and the pots would be on the floor, and the fire was beneath it. So that there was an effort made to separate the pots from the, from the, fi the, fire, the heat source. One of the reasons they figured for that is because with the pots in intimate contact with the fire, you'd have high losses. You'd have, because the, there'd be no way to control the heat up rate very, 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 easily, so you'd get a lot of cracking and, lo and losses. And so by separating it, you could cut some of your breakage losses. You'd have, again, you'd have better control and you'd, you'd reduce your losses. And so this is still, this would be considered, if you want to call this the first, this would be considered an updraft kiln because the fire is, the fire is at the base of the kiln, the, the, the heat or the flames travel up through the wear and exit through the top, just basically straight up. And there wasn't any chimney or anything, they didn't need one because the, flame, the heat and the flames were just rising up through the work, up through the wear. These kind of structures, they, they assume, can, could, could have reached slightly higher temperatures on the order of, let's say, 1650 to 1920 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly cone 010 to 04. So now we're getting into well what we consider modern, what we would, now would consider modern bisque temperatures. The next, the next sort of, some of these are arbitrary, but the next sort of major addition that was done to these structures was the addition of a permanent roof. 
instead of, instead of now depending on dirt or shards or, or ashes from a previous firing to cover the tops of the pots, the, the, the circular wall now added some kind of a permanent dome structure over it. And so that's a, that's a big step in terms of the kiln development and in terms of being able to contain the heat. So there was some kind of a dome structure. And the best, some of the best examples of these are in ancient Greece and Rome. This is, this is the kind of kiln that all the pottery in ancient, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome basically was fired in, some kind of a structure where there'd be a fire below, there'd be a separation like a perforated floor, still circular, all circular in design. There'd be a perforated floor, the fire would be above it, would be below it, the pots, and now there'd be a dome over the pots. So again, they, they, all, the, all the ancient, and they found really good examples of, these, of the Grecian and the Roman kilns that this, this thing. And they, again, and this, this is interesting, this, this basic design of a fire below and, and a, a fire chamber or a firebox, a ware chamber and, a, and some kind of a roof with, continued for centuries after, the, after this, you know, even though it started back ancient Greece, it continued, and they're still being used today in parts of the Middle East and parts of the world. This is, this is a sort of a classic updraft kiln. And this continued even into England and Europe into the, into the 19th century. There are kilns that were called bottle kilns, and a lot of different kind of kilns were used by the English potteries. Basically, just a slightly different version of the exact same kiln design, just a plain updraft kiln. You'd have some kind of a, a floor supporting the pots, you'd have a fire below it, and you'd have an exhaust, you'd have a roof with holes or, or a short chimney above it. And, so that, and that's still being used today. And then later on, this same design was adapted to burn coal because the same, they'd have, they'd have like fire boxes or ports around the outside where the fire could be located, and it was easy to convert it to coal usage, especially in England and some of the other countries. So the same design was used for coal. A different approach that was a tr to, the, to the direction that the work was going in the Middle East and in Europe were, uh, were, was occurring in, in Asia um, starting a long time ago, and these were called bank or cave kilns. And the earliest ones were literally caves dug into the side of an embankment. And if they were dug into the embankment, you could, if here's, if here's an embankment, they could dig a cave that basically looked like that with a sloping floor. And then the, the kiln, the, this, this cave itself, and the pots would be set in here, the kiln itself provided the draft like a chimney. So the fire was built in the mouth down here. The pots were loaded on, they, and there were stones set in here because it was a sloping floor. There were stones set in like steps. The pots were mounted on the steps, and then there was an exhaust at the top. And so basically, it provided, it was, it was just literally dug into the earth, but it, the, 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 the design with the incline provided essentially a chimney, provided a path for the flame to move up naturally. And the great thing about this was, is that after a while, the fire would harden the dirt. So there weren't any bricks used. It's just the, the building the fire inside the earth would harden the earth and essentially make a stable structure. Mm -hmm. And they found really good examples of these. Again, this and these, some of these early ones go back, like in China, go back as far as 3000 BCE. And then what they did was, um, basically, this, was, this evolved, this, this idea of this, this cave kiln or bank kiln evolved into very similar designs that were done above ground. So this became, this became sort of what was known as a climbing kiln because the, kiln, the floor of the kiln is at a slope. And a whole series of different designs evolved in Thailand and China and Japan and Korea, the whole, all different parts of Asia, based on the idea of an inclined tube some kind of a, t a tube design. And in, some case, and in this case, now they were built out of brick or stones. And in some cases, the, the, the tube was partially, they, they wouldn't dig it out anymore, they'd build it. But in some cases, it was built in a trench so that it was partially below ground for insulation and also for support. Um, or in some cases, it was sitting on the ground. And initially, they were all also, again, single chamber. They were just they were some kind of a tube structure set on an incline. And then over the years, also, a lot of different modifications, depending on the country or locality, evolved where they'd put in different structural supports inside or semi-partitions, and they were starting to divide up the tube into sort of different areas. One of the features of these long tube designs was that if you had a fire at the mouth, at the base, you couldn't get good temperature distribution all the way up a long tube. So they'd have stoking ports, holes in the side of the tube, all the way up along the length of the kiln, where as, if they started the fire at the bottom, 
and then, the temp and then they got pretty hot at the bottom, further up the tube it was cooler. So a little bit further up the tube, there'd be a hole in the side of the tube where they'd throw in more wood and essentially move the fire up the tube. And then they'd move it further up the tube. So there'd be all these different ports or holes along the tube where you could continue to move the fire up the tube. And this is also basically, this, this is the same as essentially the Japanese Anagama. And the Japanese Anagama was basically probably one of the closest designs mimicking the original cave because it's, it's kind of shaped the same way that the cave structure was with just a single large sort of swelling chamber that narrows down to what would be a, a, a short chimney at the back end. But again, on an incline. So they, none of these kilns had really tall chimneys attached to them at the back end because the kiln essentially provided the dread. The kiln essentially was the chimney because it was on an incline. So the flame would naturally travel up the incline. But these, these early ones were still basically all single chamber. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Then the next sort of stage in after this was multi-chamber, was dividing up this long tube, and they found that it was even more efficient, is if you have to do side stoking, basically, to, to have the fire move down the tube so that the tube gets heated up, instead, why not break up the whole tube into a series of connected chambers, and each, each chamber then is fired like its own kiln. And that's, that's the famous Naboragama design. And that's a series of, if these are still all inclined, that's a series of connected chambers, and it looks sort of something like this. If here's the ground, like that. And each chamber, each one of those is, is essentially its own kiln. But the reason why this became really efficient was, this is, this is actually now moving into a different design of kiln, what was considered actually a downdraft kiln. Each chamber is a downdraft. And what that means, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but what that means is the flame enters the chamber, goes up to the top, and then it doesn't e exit at the top like an updraft. It has to go back down to the bottom of the chamber to exit. So the flame is, it pulls the, the flame back down to the bottom of the chamber before it goes out. So this, you'd have a fire down here, so the flame would travel like this, and then it would go down, and then it would enter the next chamber, and you'd also have a stoke hole here. So you'd have fl hot flame coming from the first chamber, plus new fuel going to the second one, going to the third one. Incredibly efficient. Because you have the, each one of these is fired as a separate kiln, but the, the hot gases coming out of it are, are led into the next chamber. So it's, and, and then each one of these is loaded separately. There's a door, there'd be a door in each one of these. So each one of these you treat as if it's its own little kiln. But you put these in succession, and some of these, again, these, this might be 16 or 20 chambers long. So when this chamber reached its, its temperature, you'd stop stoking this one and you'd move to this one, and you'd move to that one. But the heat isn't being wasted because when the heat exits this one, it's not just leaving, it's going in, it's going in to help heat the next one. So incredibly efficient. And people, and these, this is the design, people still build kilns like this today. Because it's, it's a really efficient design. And the, so this, this, but this idea of a downdraft, that where, this, where, the, where the, the, the draft or the direction of the flame is moving is coming up and then going back down through the work, we're gonna talk more about this in a minute, is very efficient because you're keeping the flame in the kiln for a longer period of time. One of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is one of the features of a wood kiln is it has a very long flame, meaning that when the wood burns, you don't just get the hottest part of the flame right near the wood. It might be three or four feet or longer past it. It takes a long time for the gases from the wood and the air to mix and to burn efficiently and produce the greatest heat. So the longer you can keep this long flame into the kiln, the more heat you're gonna get out of it. So you don't want a kiln where the flame goes into the kiln and leaves you might actually be generating most of the heat after it leaves the kiln. So this is also a good design because you're keeping the flame in the kiln as long as possible and extracting as much heat from it as you can. 
So this, but now this, this, and this idea of a downdraft, this wasn't just in Asia. There were European and American designs that were also using this idea of keeping the flame in the, in the chamber as long as possible and extracting as much heat. And you may have seen some of these around. They're called beehive kilns. And they were used in Europe. And they look, they have a dome roof like this. And they're circular in outline. And typically, they might have a chimney, a separate chimney, and you'd have, you'd have fire boxes around the outside where the fire was. The fire would go in, through the, and the work is stacked in here, and exit through the floor, and then it's connected by an underground tunnel to a chimney. And this was a really common kind of kiln that was used to fire bricks. These are all over. There are some of these kilns still in existence in the botanical gardens in Washington, D.C. There are three or four of them right up here in Martinsburg at Continental Brick Company. And, and the, the point about this was you could have several kilns connected to the same chimney. So this was a downdraft. The firebox would come in. The flame would rise up, be pulled by the draft from the chimney down through the thing, out through the floor and out through the chimney. And so you might have three or four kilns of these beehives clustered around one chimney, all connected to the same chimney. But you're still using the downdraft principle. That was the point. So this was just this was a European slash American version of using this downdraft principle. And that and that this is this is this and this, so this this sort of brings us and again these designs these designs are still being used in places and people are still building kilns with these designs because it's a fairly efficient design. And there are two, if you talk about current now kiln designs, there are at least two different ways of talking about, and I've introduced it a little bit, of talking about the different kind of kiln designs. And one of them is based, the first is based on the flame path direction. And I'll, let me mention this again now, is that when you actually burn wood, and let's talk about wood in this case, what actually happens is when you put the wood into, when you start a fire and you put the wood into the fire, the first thing you're doing is you're actually cooking the wood. You're cooking the wood and you're cooking gases, flammable gases out of the wood. And the first thing that's burning are those flammable gases. And when the flammable gases, there's no more gases coming out of the wood, but you'll end up with, with his charcoal. And then the charcoal burns. So there are multiple stages in the way the wood burns. But when the gases are, are being cooked out of the wood, they have to mix with the air that's coming into the kiln in order to burn. And that's, why, that's what takes a long time. Because there's nothing in the kiln. You don't have fans or blowers or anything to get a good, there's no structure in there. You just have air streaming in and gases streaming out of the wood. So it takes a long time, relatively long time, for the air to mix with all that flammable gas and, and burn and produce heat. So, so you, can have a, you can have the flame from starting from the wood could be feet long, three, four, five, six more, lo, feet longer before the, it's really burning efficiently and producing a lot of heat. So anyway, based, so there, there are three basic designs for, for, any, for any fuel burning kiln based on the, on the flame path direction. And those are updraft, crossdraft, and downdraft. Mm -hmm. And so... And nowadays, most people, people are not, at least in this country and in the more advanced areas, are not building updraft wood-fired wood kilns. Those are the early ones that I talked about where you have a circular pit and the work and the, air and the gas would just travel up through the wear and out the top. Most of the people are building what are called cross-draft or down-draft designs. Cross-draft is literally that, that essentially, if you have a shelf of pots, the flame is hitting them sideways. And so in a long straight tube, like some of these early dragon kilns, basic, excuse me, basically they were cross-draft designs because <laughs> the flame was just going sideways past all the pots and exiting the kiln. But in these smaller chambers, now you can develop this downdraft idea where the flame comes in and goes up to the top of the chamber and then is pulled back down through the chamber, down past the pots, and then exits. That's a downdraft. And the downdraft is probably the most efficient, and this is what enabled a lot of the Asian potters to reach these incredibly high temperatures, cone 10 and above, is the downdraft, because given the size of the chamber, that keeps the flame in the chamber the longest. It creates the longest path. If, flame, if the flame comes in toward the bottom and has to rise all the way up and go all the way back down before it can exit, that provides, rather than going straight across the chamber, that gives you the longest path, which means the flame is in the chamber the longest amount of time, which means you're getting the most amount of heat out of it. So that's the most efficient design, is the downdraft. 
because the flame is being kept in the chamber the longest. You're, you're, you're keeping it, you'd like to keep the flame there indefinitely and get all, until it's cold and then let the gases out. Well, you can't do that. But the longer you can keep it in the chamber to extract the heat, the better off you are. And the other thing to think about is, which maybe I should have mentioned earlier, but when you're, when you're a wood kiln or any kind of, but especially wood, and, but gas is also true, is that you basically have a river of flame moving through the kiln. That's the easiest way to think about it. It's like a river of flame. And the kiln design and the way you stack it affects the path of that, this river. And, 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 how, and the longer you can keep that river in the kiln and get the heat out of it, the, the, the more efficient the kiln is going to be. The, the less fuel you'll use, the higher temperature you can reach. So yeah, anyway, so, you, have those, so you, can, you can think about kiln designs in terms of those features, like what's the flame path? Is it an updraft? Is it a downdraft? Or is it a crossdraft? And then the other thing is the number of wear chambers. Is it a single chamber um, kiln, or are there multiple chambers? And the multiple chambers could be Nabora Gama, where they're all the same kind, but people are also building hybrid kilns where you might build an anagama in the front and then put a, an, arch chamber, an arch type of kiln on the back end. People have been doing that increasingly, where you don't just repeat the same type of chamber. You'll have maybe three different types of chambers connected to one another. You're still taking advantage of the fact that you're keeping the flame in the kiln for a longer period of time, but you change the design of the chamber for one reason or another. Then let's talk about some prime, what I'm calling primary design features of wood-burning kilns. And there are really three things you need to talk about, or three different parts of the structure. The heat source, the wear chamber, and the chimney. And if, we're, and if we're not talking about updraft kilns, then you have to have a chimney. Because basically, a wood if, and if the, the closest analogy maybe is like a fireplace. What's, what's drawing in the air to burn the wood is the chimney. The chimney gets hot, the air and the, the, air, the, the air in the chimney, the chimney gets hot and the gas and the hot gases in the chimney, the, that wants to rise up because it's lighter, it's lighter density than the air around it. And so that creates a draft that pulls in air through the kiln. That's why the kiln is, works, basically. It wouldn't burn without a chimney because you need to create that draft. You need something to pull in the, the, the new air to burn, heat up the gases, the gases ride, and they continue to pull in more air. So with a, with a downdraft especially, and with a crossdraft, you need a chimney. An updraft, you don't because the kiln itself is the chimney, basically. The hot gases can rise naturally by themselves. As far as the heat source, this also has multiple parts. There's generally what's called the combustion chamber or the firebox. And this is actually where, the, where the, the wood, in this case, is loaded in, into the firebox. And you need something in the firebox to support the wood. Again, this depends on different designs and different efficiencies, but generally you just don't want to make a pile of wood on the bottom of the kiln. That's not the most efficient way to burn the wood. Because when you're burning wood, or when you're burning anything, you want to mix the fuel with the air, right? The more you can, the more, the more efficient, you, more efficiently you can mix air and fuel, the better burning you're going to get. So if you just pile the wood on the bottom, that's not going to be very efficient because there isn't a lot of weight for the air to get at the wood. So you, you generally want to support the wood and have the air coming up through it or down through it so the air can have good contact with the wood. So that means you either need some kind of a grate, which is typically made out of metal, metal bars or something, or they do what they call hobs, H-O-B-S. And these are basically projections from the side of the, the wall of the kiln that you lay the log on. So if I, had a, if I had a wall, if I had a wall that looked like this, I'd have a brick that sticked out like that, and my log would, be, would rest on that. The problem with, with using hobs is you need wood cut to a certain length because it has to rest on the hobs. But, the, these, these, but in this case, you don't need any iron bars. They'd just be bricks or something sticking out from the side. Whereas, whereas you could have iron bars that the wood can rest on. But you need something to support the, to support the wood. Great, it's grates or hobs. You also need an ash pit because you need a place where when the wood burns, the ash can collect and get out of the way. If that's the problem with a bonfire, is that the ash stays there. The ash is done burning and it doesn't contribute to the fire at that point, it's done. And so you need to get that out of the way. So you generally have a pit underneath the area where the wood is supported so the ash can fall down and get out of the way and, and be removed from the, from the burning wood because otherwise it just blocks the fire. So you need an ash pit. You also generally need, as part of the same structure, you need air inlets. 
You need some way in this combustion chamber, this firebox, for the air to get in and have access to the wood. And there are lots of different designs and different arrangements, but you need some way to, for the air to get into the, to the firebox. And then also, in general, this whole structure, this, this sort of source of the heat, this little sort of mini wood-burning furnace, you've created, if you want to call it that, there are, there are different, ways, different places you can locate that relative to the wear chamber. It can actually be inside the same structure, or internal, or it can be external. And there are advantages or differences between those. Between those. There are, frankly, there are a lot of really badly designed inefficient kilns out there that people build, and they're horribly inefficient. But for whatever reason, people like them for different reasons. But, but that's another point is where is the firebox located? Is it actually closer to the wear chamber, which is more efficient? Or is it sort of stuck onto the outside of the kiln, which is less efficient? And when I'm talking about efficiency, this, this is a term that's misused a lot. But efficiency, what you really mean is how much fuel did you burn to fire a certain weight of clay? That's the best way to compare it. If you want to determine, and I've seen a lot of articles on comparing efficiency of kilns, and they don't make it very specific. And the easiest way to do it is, is if you can keep track of the kiln, the, the fuel you used, weigh your pots when you take them out of, the, out of the kiln, and you can say, okay, how much fuel did I use to burn to fire a pound of pots, or 100 pounds of pots, whatever it is. How much fuel did I use to fire a certain amount of, a certain weight of clay? That's the efficiency of the kiln. Because people say, oh, this kiln's really efficient. You say, well, yeah, and I burned three cords and I fired 100 pots. You know, it's like, that's not efficient. I mean, and by the way, I should have mentioned also is all wood kilns are horribly inefficient. So it, we're t when we're talking about efficiency, we're talking relative. Roughly, in round numbers, only 5% of the, the energy that you burn goes into heating the pots. 5%, roughly, in round numbers. Could be eight, might be less. It's probably never more than 10. They're, they're all horribly inefficient, but we, if you talk about still, you, people still are comparing the kilns and saying, this is a more efficient design. Well, they're all horribly inefficient, but what, which one is a little less inefficient? And, so, and that still should be based on fuel per, pound, fuel per pound or fuel per amount of clay. How much, how much fuel did you use? And it doesn't matter in this case whether it's electricity or gas or whatever. How much fuel did you use to fire a certain amount of pots? That's the efficiency. The second, the second major feature in a, in a wood burn kiln is the wear chamber or chambers itself. What's the arrangement of them? What's the structure of them? This can vary a lot with just the geometry of the kiln. Is it low and wide? Is it tall and skinny? Is it deep? And I don't know that we have a time to go into a lot. We can, t by the way, if, if, there's, if there's a lot of interest in this, we can do, talk more about this in the future at other, you know, other things. This was meant to be an overview, but I just want to let you know that the, the design of the wear chamber also contributes a lot to the way the kiln fires. What's the arrangement of the, the, the thing? Um, is it, for instance, if, if you have a flat top kiln where basically you don't have an arch, you just have some kind of a flat roof, those are less efficient because you get dead corners. Flame does not want to go, like if in heating, in heating up a room like this, the heat in this room does not want to go up into the, or go into the corners. It not, because it's, it's flowing like a river, so it, it doesn't want to just go into a corner and make a, make a sharp turn and leave the corner. It tends to just go, skirt the corner. So anytime you have corners in a kiln, in a chamber, they're not going to get as hot. They're going to be cold spots. So it's not going to be as efficient. And finally, so, and so the final component that you need is a chimney, and you need, with a, with a downdraft or a crossdraft, you need a chimney to pull the air in. And the chimney works the same as your fireplace. The, the, the warm air in the chimney rises because it's less dense than the, than the air around it, and the cold air, the, the, the atmospheric pressure, pushes it, basically sinks below it and pushes it up. Well, when that, that actually creates a, what's called a draw, or a suction, if you want to call it, and it pulls in fresh air at the bottom. So that's what's allowing your, your wood to burn, is the fact that the chimney, the hot gases are rising out the chimney and drawing in the air you need to burn the wood that's still in there. So the, the construction of the chimney, even the shape of the chimney is important. The, the shape of the opening, is it, is, it, is it square, is it rectangular? And especially the size of the chimney and the height of the chimney relative to the kiln are really important, are critical features. Because you need a certain amount, you need draft to get the kiln to burn efficiently. One of the problems we'll mention later is the fact that one of the big problems with some kiln designs is that the chimney is inadequate to introduce enough air and you can't reach temperature. You just can't get enough air pulled into the kiln to, get, to, to reach temperature because you can't burn the wood fast enough and enough of it. So the chimney, the chimney design itself is a really important, is an important component of the kiln. 
basically when you're burning wood, it's two stage. You're cooking, the, the first thing you're doing is you're cooking the wood and you're driving these gas, you're distilling the wood. You're driving these gases, the volatile gases out, and those gases are burning. And then when those have come out, then you burn the cellulose that's left, which is the charcoal. And when the charcoal is burning, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very short flame. It's, just, it's producing a lot of heat and it's heating up the gases, but it's very short. But the long flame is from the gases that are being cooked out of the wood during the early start of the, then the early part of the fire. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time. So if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.